Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Love Grove on Health. My name is Dominic Lukes. I'm the Product Marketing Manager here at Skills for Health. And joining me is Andrew Lovegrove, who is our Senior Consultant. How are things with you, Andrew? Hi there, Dom. Great to be back with you. It's been a little while since we did one of these. So uh, I think Easter got in the way of the last, since we did our last recording. And then we've had bank holidays and Jubilee weekends and all the rest of it. But uh, now feels a good time to be back in front of the microphone. Yeah, we took a we took a, like a little mid season break. Thought we'd just review how the podcasters sort of reached out to the sector, sort of reviewed the the highs, which didn't take too long, and the lows, <laughs> which thankfully didn't take too long either. <laughs> That's right. But um, no, like you said, it's it's great to be back for this session. We're going to do like a sort of news recap, perhaps so, some of the news stories that we've sort of come across in the last couple of weeks or so. And then towards the end, we'll have an exciting announcement for Love Grove on our health and our and our next our next podcast. But yes, yes, people who are listening, please don't jump just to the last five minutes to hear <laughs> that. Um, you know, please stay with us for for the, for the duration. Um, I I know how these tricks. Uh, uh, I know how these tricks work. Yeah, you're right. Actually, I thought that would be a nice little teaser, but I hadn't thought about the fast forward button. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to jump on some news and we're going to kick start with uh, a story that you came across, Andrew. I think this was in the HSJ journal, wasn't it? Oh, yes. So, well, before we do that, Don, can I just give a special shout out and a thank you um, to all those To people. me? Well, to you, of course, obviously, <laughs> but um, I am thinking about those people, you know, we've had three bank holidays since we last recorded mm. this and for many people out there they've not had a bank holiday weekend you know particularly i was thinking over the jubilee weekend you know when you saw you know the blue light services there working you know very hard and very very warm conditions you know lots of crowds and what have you and you know hospitals didn't close over the weekends that we've had so i always think we should just take a moment just to thank those people who've, who've carried on for them it's just been another working day so uh, thank you to everyone out there yeah absolutely but yes um to business uh, and i suppose a a bit of a bit of a double-edged knife for me don uh, because i've seen a story that very much champions workforce development but then kind of makes me sort of um, want to curl up into a ball that some of those things that have been said about this innovation are, are still being said. And um, I uh, read about um, a hospital in the Northwest. Um, I think I'm all right naming it. It's uh, Blackpool uh, Hospital uh, up in Lancashire, which is a, was a favoured place for me as a child for days out and what have you, but that's probably for another podcast entirely. The hospital um, has tried, um, just trying to recruit as we speak, an advert for a a non-medical consultant level practitioner who would work in the trust's emergency department. And whilst that level of practice is not kind of brand new or or exciting necessarily in of itself, it's the difference here is they want people um, who will form part of, without being too technical, the tier five uh, consultant rotor. So they would be form part of the highest level of uh, clinical decision makers within the organisation. And it would be a, a non-medical consultant who would sit on that rotor. And you know, I remember when advanced clinical practice and consultant level practice were new innovations. And, you know, I think largely they've kind of bedded themselves in within uh, the health sector. But this is, I suppose, taking it to, to, to its to the next, one could argue, its ultimate uh, level that you could have consultant level practice. Uh, truly being carried out by somebody who is not medically qualified. So it's a great, you know, and I, I've not been involved in the work at Blackpool, but obviously I would imagine quite a bit of workforce development has gone on in the background behind this. So 
and really pleased to see this innovation. But then I've seen um, reports, and again, you know, social media, bit of a mixed bag and blessing at times, where some, uh, on Twitter, I think, some doctors have uh, taken uh, great, I suppose, offence, uh, umbrage at this, um, and have used some, frankly, some very offensive language, you know, comparing the role to flight attendants piloting the plane and I suppose really reinforcing some of those stereotypes that, you know, all nurses are just simply doctors, handmaidens. And if that was ever true, which I don't necessarily agree with, it's certainly not true today. And actually to get to that level of practice, you know, you've got to be at the top of your game. You know, you've got to have a master's qualification, you, you know, in advanced clinical practice, you will have been through very, very comprehensive uh, assessments and, you know, really been tested uh, thoroughly. And so for me, provided the appropriate safeguards are in place, that there's a governance framework that supports it, I welcome this innovation. But it's just sad to think we're only a tweet or two away from people making quite disparaging comments and largely ill-informed ones. You know, I, I, I was kind of insulted on on kind of multiple levels, really. You know, comparing pilots and flight attendants is not comparing doctors and nurses. You know, even to compare, you know, flight attendants, actually, you know, they are very skilled people in their own right. Yeah. And they don't just hand out the warm nuts and the, you know, the champagne, you know, that they actually have a huge responsibility. It just felt as though I was reading an article from, you know, 40 years ago and not, not today. So mm. really pleased to see the innovation. I hope it has been planned for and, you know, safety concerns have been considered because I think there are some concerns there to think about what can be planned for, but disappointed that there were, it, it received quite a, a negative initial reaction from people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like you said, they haven't, you know, they're not recruiting for a consultant off the street. There is that sector experience and there is those qualifications within the, the nursing arena. You know, there, yeah. there is a lot of experience that needs to still be applied for that role, well, for that successful applicant. To, yes. So, and ju- just ju- just your thoughts on, on what was happening on social media. Do you actually think these potentially could influence some of these trusts and, and hospitals in terms of how they recruit for these sort of roles in the future tweets you know it's very easy to send a a tweet you know in the heat of the moment um Mm. i do have a twitter presence yeah but i'm quite reserved in how i use it because i could say a lot you know it's that old adage you know act in haste repent uh, at leisure and i think are people feeling threatened at the moment you know Mm. despite the workforce shortages are people concerned about their own career progression? Is it, and I ask this question, is it that historically um, a lot of the space that was occupied by the medical workforce, they were the only workforce in town to provide those particular elements of care? And now we're showing that there are other professions who are not, someone once said to me, well, you know, as a nurse, why would you want to become a mini doctor? And my reply to that has always been, it's not about being a mini doctor, it's about being a maxi nurse. I would argue that, the, you know, whoever gets that post will not see themselves as a, you know, a, a medic on the cheap. They will see themselves as a very highly qualified, skilled practitioner who has, for example, um, demonstrated the requisite knowledge, skills and behaviours, uh, but through a different route. It's all about equivalence. But that can be that can be threatening when historically what you've done has only been done by you. And, you know, I know within nursing, um, I remember when, you know, it's kind of, you know, a, a much richer skill mix was introduced to the nursing workforce. A lot of my colleagues felt quite concerned and threatened by that because they felt the things that made them a, 
a nurse were almost being picked at and and potentially devalued. But for me, I've always very much been an outcomes led practitioner. It's about meeting the need of the person. That's got that's always got to be you know center stage of our thinking and our decision making. Yeah, and sometimes that involves us. You know, frankly, we have to get over ourselves a bit. But I don't believe that argument should be taken to extremes because I think each professional group adds, you know, a particular, you know, flavour, perspective, whatever you want to call it, to meet the holistic needs uh, of people out there. So I'm not sure that answers your question, Don. Well, no, it does. Do you think the objections are based on the seniority of the of the position? Do you think is that? Do you think where that hostility rises? I think it's it's probably the last taboo for the non medical workforce because we've always, you know, for a long time now, let's say they can do seventy or eighty percent of what's traditionally been done by medics. This is an example of well, actually we're going to let people contribute to, to the lot. That's probably not a very technically correct way of putting it, but it's probably the easiest way I can say it on here. So I think there is there's still a sense of only a doctor can tell another doctor what to do. I think there's still in some important quarters in medicine, there is very much, you know, that, that culture, that hierarchical culture still exists. And I understand to some degree why it exists, you know, the, the you know the awesome responsibility that, that the medical workforce have and, you know, the, literally the can that they carry. But I think it's, you know, is that fit for purpose for the, you know, the increasingly, you know, the uh, the middle part of this century, you know, are, 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 we, are we applying old ways of thinking? I'm going to say something now which I've got no basis for fact in. Okay. I think there's a whiff of misogyny about this. I think we still traditionally, when we think of, of a doctor, we think of a man in a white coat and we think of a nurse as being, you know, a woman in a dress. And it's, I think mm. a large part of our, that people, people think that. I can say mm. with absolute conviction that that is not the case. I am li- quite literally living proof of that. But I think there's this idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's the only, you know, I, you know, you're only a nurse. And it's the idea that potentially, you know, it, it may be a nurse, it might be an, an AHP in this role and other roles, you know, moving forward. But with nursing, there is that kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you know, you're just a nurse. And I experienced this in my own professional practice. Somebody once said to me, you know, what's the reason you became a nurse? Because you didn't get good enough A-level grades. <laughs> Um, honestly yeah right. uh, yeah because you know almost you know as a man and you know you're quite good at your job why on earth would you would you train to be a nurse well the answer is because that's what I wanted to do mm. you know my a-level grades were neither here nor there I knew which path I wanted to follow I was quite lucky I was very clear from quite a young age what it is I wanted to do but I I I fear although this is would not be said explicitly in some of the tweets i I fear a whiff of misogyny about this. Yeah, it's been portrayed by Hollywood. I'm, you know, you're just talking then, and I was just thinking back to that film. Was it? I need to get my pronunciation right here. Was it Meet the Fockers? Wasn't it? Yes. And it was Ben Stiller. Yes. And um, you know, the, the fact he always brought out the fact that he was a nurse, and that was constantly kind of implied and ridiculed during the film by Mr. Yes. Mayer and Owen Wilson and some others. And like you said, it's, there is that stigma, isn't there, about the nursing profession and the role? Yes. You know, and, and I was listening, just to bore people even further, I was in the car listening to Any Questions and The Moral Maze on Radio 4 last week, uh, driving back from Birmingham. And Melanie Phillips was on there and was quite critical of the professionalisation of nursing um, because obviously now nursing is a graduate profession and was very much implying that, you know, that's done very little to raise standards. And, it, you know, it, it almost had that whiff of, well, if, if if nurses just got back to doing what we think they should do and almost, you know, let's you know, you know almost 
don't don't you know don't reach for the stars just keep your eyes down on the ground I, I, I do think there is a whiff of that I, again but that's a feeling I've got no evidence to support that mm. I, I do think it's a factor that was a really interesting chat and I think it, it's probably just worth keeping tabs on that isn't it actually as a, as a news story it'd be really interesting to see you know how that role's filled how it's performed whether it gives a precedent for other hospitals and trusts to yes to look at these sort of new recruitment yes. methodologies because like you said you know staff shortages is is an issue and looking at different ways to get people within the system has to be applauded well what is the alternative you know as a workforce planner I've consistently always been told, oh, well, we need more of that particular workforce. So is it, you know, mm. consultant level practitioners, is you know, registered nurses? And we'll keep writing in our workforce plan, we need more of them. Well, if you can't recruit the ones you need already, what makes you think you're going to get any more? And now if that... <laughs> That's uh, a good point. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if that plan is not based on ev- on any evidence of success you know you know your workforce supply is you know trickling then what you know is your strategy will cross our fingers and hope for the best or do you look at alternative ways because for me you either don't recruit and have not nobody which i think we can all agree would be a poor outcome we live on temporary contingent labour again very expensive and not very good from an outcomes perspective or we look at alternative models of working to support you know frankly new models of care and enhancing existing yeah. models of care so if you present uh, my first option might be you know we'll recruit people as per our existing model but if that's not realistic or achievable then I would rather look at alternatives than A, do nothing, or B, just sit in a cupboard with my fingers crossed. Because I know which one has got more, more more robustness to it. Well, this actually feels quite quite a nice natural lead into our next story. So something that I came across on the, I think it was on the BBC News site, the Royal College of Nursing uh, convention is taking place at the moment. Mm-hmm. And some of the some of the headlines coming out of there was one in 10 nurse posts in England remains unfilled. So, you know, talking, you know, naturally about some some of the staff shortages taking place at the moment and also looking at some of the some of the feedback. I think there was a survey of about 20,000 nurses and just some of the struggles that they're experiencing at the moment in terms of the level of care that they can provide to patients. And you're just wondering what the what the retention levels are going to be looking like in the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean... I could just say yes to all of that, Dom, because okay. it, 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 you know, I, th- I think some of the stats um, speak for themselves. And, mm. you know, I've sort of celebrated my you know, quarter century working in, in, in the health sector. In fact, I'm well over that. I was going to say, you're definitely older than that. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't tell you how young I was when I entered it, did I? But, yeah, there was... Um, <laughs> It almost, I don't know, there's a sense of full circle going on at the moment in my thinking. Mm. I i joined the profession when it had had almost years of underinvestment, years of not training enough people, organisations in whatever form they were not having enough money and a very bleak outlook for the future. You know, uh, you know almost, you know, why on earth? A friend of mine said, "You know, why on earth do you want to go and work in health, Andrew? When it's you know it's so bleak as it as, as it was. I remember the first ward I ever worked on; half the beds wouldn't rise up and down, uh, and there was no money for, for for any new ones. So there is a sense of deja vu about this, and I think we are kind of it's." Again, as a child of the eighties, I remember those videos of the crash de- crash test dummies from. Germany or was it Sweden and used to see them driving in slow motion and it just feels as though the car's getting ever closer to the buffer. Mm, that's a good analogy. One in ten is the average, but there will be hot spots. 
there are areas within nursing that have, you know are going to be experiencing much higher levels of vacancies, um, staff shortages, and there will be areas of the country that are experiencing you know even higher levels uh, than that. Absolutely. One one of the stats that came out for me was. Um, these are figures from the Nursing and Midwifery Council. 25,000 nurses and midwives left the register last year in the UK, more than were trained yes. domestically. It's a net loss. Now, what we're doing, again, I remember, I hope I'm not turning into sort of Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets uh, here, Dom, but uh, again, a cultural reference that's got a very much an age stamp on it. But, you know, I remember we went out, particularly at the time to the Philippines, South Africa to recruit nurses. Again, I've always had a kind of an ethical consideration about that. You know, is is, is that quite literally the, the definition of robbing Peter to pay Paul? But bringing in overseas nurses again has its own challenges. It's not a quick fix, easy solution. Not least once people have got through the hoops of. Um, registering um, here in, in in the country, and you know, frankly, getting used to uh, the, the UK health systems, then are people going to stay? You know, will people want to stay here? There's something, you know. Again, colleagues of mine in their twenties went and did you know a few years working abroad, but then you know, life tends to be a bit of a boomerang. It tends to bring you back to your roots you know where you where you consider home you know again that's a very broad term but and you know when I think what has UK PLC got to offer because we we may offer people things like a golden hello and you know relatively small retention premium but when the house housing market is booming the way it is at the moment you know can you you know can you afford to buy somewhere can you afford to put roots mm. down in an area or are you just going to see yourself as you know a, very much a transient contingent member of the of, of the workforce so relying on overseas recruitment tends to have a lot of upfront pain there's then kind of like a nice you know middle bit but then it's not a long-term sustainable it doesn't feel like a long-term fix at all does it now again I could, you know, I could, I could, um, I could talk myself into. Oh, let's be controversial. So, I think removing the nursing bursary was a very, very short-sighted decision. It was made under the Cameron Osborne government. Now, their argument was that a we needed to save the money, and b it would actually then put nursing on a on on parity with you know other professions. So. You know, we, we, we would only be treating nurses in the same way that we treat, you know, people trained to become a physio or an occupational therapist, et cetera, et cetera. And that, you know, one could argue is, is, is in of itself is true. But having done a nursing academic programme, there are differences, not least, you know, the length of some of the programmes. And very much even though, students are supernumerary in theory in practice you are very much seen as part of the workforce when you are there on placement um that's disguised and i can hear uh, practice educators you know saying that's not the case our students are supernumerary you know it says so they're not in the, they're not counted in the numbers well okay technically they're not but are you really telling me you don't think about them when you're you know, dealing with departments that are short-staffed, mm, discuss. So it is It is a very intense programme. And nursing works when we recruit the widest sort of members of society. You know, we don't just want a nursing cohort to be filled with people like me when I enter the profession at, you know, 18 and 19. One of my best friends when I trained to be a nurse was someone who had just turned 40, which seemed really old to me at the time. But, you know, 40 is very much in the uh, rear view. Prime of your life. Absolutely. But I benefited for somebody like that being on the course because she brought a 
different insights. So join tutorials when we were talking. Mean, when you're 18, you're very certain about things. You know, you 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 have, you know, it, it, it's it's black and white. Whereas I think when you get older, you recognise the world's more ten shades of grey. So our course benefited from people who were coming into nursing as a second career option you know maybe taking time out to have a family or had done something completely different and decided at that point nursing was for them well you've got to think about how you're going to sustain yourself and indeed your family for three yeah. years so the the nursing yeah. bursary was very much it was an enabler it was it, you know we, we talk about social mobility what was the value what, what what's the bursary worth so Per individual, the amount was not huge. It was, you know, it was a few hundred pounds a month. Right. But it was enough, you know, it was it was a contribution to, you know, keeping body and soul together. So a lot lower than some of the, the, the teaching support that you can get. So I, I'll be honest, I, I, I don't have those figures to hand. But About 20,000 for the sciences and English. You know, I think to me that was a that was a retrogressive move that was made. It was largely mm. and roundly condemned at the time, and I think we are living now some of the, you know decisions we make in policy aren't always felt immediately. They take several years to work their way through and be baked through the system, and I think we're now really living yeah. that policy decision. So that's something I would I would certainly look at if I had the power. Yeah, one of the the quotes that I picked up from the from the convention was um, the, the the amount of nurses that were saying they were mentally exhausted and, and burnt out, and like you said, I, I think once they're lost, they are lost, aren't they? There's no no way of getting them back, or they go into private care. Well, indeed, although private care is perhaps not quite the the land of milk and honey that it was mm. once certainly perceived mm. as and indeed the reality of it. But I think, again, I don't want to get all sort of NHS employers in the podcast, but, you know, the changes to the pension scheme uh, have made, for example, sort of retiring and then returning was a popular career sort of stage. You know, I'm ready to not work full time, but may access my pension and then return, you know, on a part-time basis. Well, that doesn't always necessarily work for people now because of some of the, again, I'm sure the economic arguments for changing the pension scheme was sound, but in terms of workforce sustainability, it can have unintended consequences. So you've kind of got, you know, some structural problems there. We agreed not to mention the C word, but we've had two years of extreme pressures within the health service there's no signs of that getting worse in fact of uh, getting better sorry it never you know demand complexity acuity is a one-way street i have never seen it you know we never go back to anything it's always going forward and then i you know you you, you hear you know certainly in primary care you know staff being assaulted and you just think to yourself I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. You know, everybody has got their, you know, their limits. Doesn't matter how resilient you are, everybody's got a, a, a point of no return. And I think people are now galloping to that point rather than it being a slow stroll. You know, don't get me wrong, Don. There's never been a golden era to work in the health sector. <laughs> It's always been challenging, you know, even when people talk about the good old days. Believe me, there were no good old days. Each year has, has had its own challenges and they were dealt with, but it does feel at the moment we're in a bit of an ever-decreasing circle and I think we're going to need something big to reverse that trend. And I, Sadly, I hate finishing this piece on a negative. I don't see the big bang there, but what we are trying to do is what we can control, make changes, improvements, and again, create rewarding opportunities for people to have, you know, successful careers and a clear development and uh, workforce plan. Yeah. Well, we had many more news stories to talk about, but um, there was there was a couple of little pieces that I saw. One was quite close to, to me. I, I live in the West Mids. 
a news story that came out about the ambulance service at the risk of collapse, but it feels like it's kind of same sort of theme as before. So perhaps we'll finish on this GP's directory. There's been this um, uh, sort of poll that was undertaken by the Nuffield Trust, and, and they did this review that looked at the areas with the fewest GPs. And obviously the NHS, the founding principles were about it being a quality, a, a service for all. And what, looking at the data for me, it just showed how unequal it is across the UK to get a GP appointment. If in the west of the country, good opportunities, but the, the southeast and the court and sort of Essex and, and the, the east coast, incredibly difficult. One of the headline stats were there's equivalent of more than 2,000 patients for every GP and people are just unable to get a GP appointment. Just perhaps your top level thoughts on on that news. Yeah, uh, I I saw the map. I thought it was interesting. There is a bit of a a broad, again, there are notable exceptions, but they did feel a bit of a east-west divide within within England generally again the southeast the south coast again they're very expensive places to live are people even on a GP salary back in here people saying you know but yeah you know, can they afford to to live and work in those areas are there areas of particular high need you know high high deprivation again GPs have frankly taken a kicking in the last, you know, I won't name the newspaper concerned, but of basically that they've become the whipping, you know, the whipping boy for, for for many a front page story. And are people just leaving in droves? There's more and more expectation, you know, that as we're building more and more houses, my own local town, you know, it almost feels that like we're building a town on top of the town. But the number of GP surgeries, actual GPs themselves, doesn't go up. It stays the same. So, you know, is the left hand of planning talking to the to the right hand? I know schools is another is uh, is a, is a, is another uh, hot spot. So, um, I think it just for me, it GPs obviously take quite literally you know years and years to train so you know even if we filled every medical pre-registration place and you know everybody went into you know gp registrar training that's not going to be felt for um you know quite a long time so i think it's therefore it's more important that we try and think about okay well how do we reconfigure our services and how do we think about our workforce and how do we promote primary care as a you know you know as as a destination to want to go and work in because again I'm not sure I'm thinking about pre-registration training it's not somewhere you spend an awful lot of time in when I trained you spent no time at all in primary care that has changed uh, slightly but it is not you know, one does not spend the majority of one's time there. So are we doing all we can to promote it? Yeah. It was, again, some of, some of the, the headlines coming out of this report, the Royal College of GPs, increasing numbers, walking away from the profession, retiring early, reducing their hours, less than two-thirds of the workforce now work full-time. Mm-hmm. So, again, it's mirroring exactly what we've just been discussing with the with the nursing profession. Yep, so more and more GPs are now salaried as opposed to being a mm. partner in a practice. You know, there has been talk about almost nationalising primary care. Whether that will have any legs, I don't know. But the medical workforce now are saddled with the same, well, not even higher levels of student debt. So buying into a practice is not something that may be, you know, achievable. People decide to work you know, part-time for many reasons. And again, I'm very much aware of some of the changes that have been made in the doctor's pension scheme, where actually it quite literally is not worth your while to work over and above, because not only are you taxed to the hilt, you're actually then penalised later later on for doing it, which, you know, it's kind of like perverse incentive on top of perverse incentive. Mm. Yeah. I really enjoyed that chat. Shall we let our listeners know about what we have planned for the for the next podcast 
Yes. So we at Skills for Health, working with Health Education England and NHS England and NHS Improvement, very recently launched the new career and core capability framework for primary care nurses and uh, general practice nurses in England. Um, that framework is now uh, available. Dom, I'm sure you'll put something in uh, for people to, 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 to access that. And that involved us working with, you know, a huge number of, of stakeholders, subject matter experts, um, colleagues at NHS England Improvement, HEE, um, chaired the, the project to develop the framework was chaired by a wonderful individual, Julia Taylor, um, who worked with us on a previous framework for advanced clinical practice for primary care and um, has been an amazing advocate for primary care nursing, showing that, you know, from healthcare assistant through to consultant level practice, there is a role for you in primary care. So the framework is there to partly showcase what a career framework needs to do, you know, what, what the, the levels of practice are, but also to be able to articulate the core capabilities needed and, you know, basically for primary care to show that it's a viable option for people, but also what the knowledge, skills and behaviours you need to be able to work in that setting. So our next podcast will be slightly different, won't it, Don? Oh, I'm, I'm being replaced. <laughs> but no, it's great. Well, it's you're being... You're being supplemented. Oh, okay. um, we are gonna, we're going to be joined by uh, Julia. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about the framework in a little bit more detail, yeah. but also really get some absolute first hand recent experience, maybe talk through some, some of the challenges from Julia's point of view, but also show how, whilst we may not be able to do all of the big bang stuff here at Skills for Health, we are helping. In, in our own way by providing you know really supportive well-grounded solutions to workforce planning and workforce development which contributes hopefully to the ongoing success of the sector so all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening to this latest edition of love grove on health a reminder that our podcast can be found on all the major platforms including spotify amazon apple and google and that's where you can also subscribe so you never miss an episode you can also find the recordings on our skills for health website and social channels until next time many thanks bye <laughs>